Ishaji Putram Atra Sukham Rupam Tasagraja Muri Purim Maturim Gosuatim Radha Oh, Radhika, oh, Radhvasam Raptoyas Pratita Kripaya Sri Guru Tam Natosmi Gurave Kaura Chandra Radhika Yitadale Krishna Raya Krishna Bhakta Tad Bhakta Yanunam Ananda Lila Maya Vigraha Hema Bhadda Vyatschavi Sundara Tasmai Mahaprema Rasapradha Chaitanya Chandra Yanunam Asti Chaitanya Chandra Yanunam Asti Chaitanya Chandra Yamunasri First of all, I offer my heart like flowers thousands and thousands of times at the lotus feet of my holy master, my supremely worshipable spiritual guru, by whose causeless mercy and very diligent endeavors the nectar of bhakti, pure brain, love for Sri Krishna descends to this world. Nitilila Pravishtam Vishnupada Shtodar Satishimad Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Secondly, I offer my pranam at the lotus feet of my Guru's Guru and to his Guru and to his Guru and all the great spiritual masters going back 37 generations. 5,000 years to see Krishna Himself. And finally, I offer my pranam to all of you, my very dear brothers and sisters. What is Bhakti Yoga? In Sanskrit, Bhakti Yoga is also called a Jaiva Dharma. And Jaiva means of the Jiva, the living being. We are all conscious living spiritual beings. Everything, human beings, animals, birds, insects, plants, everything which is living is animated by the presence of soul, the jiva, jiva. So, bhakti yoga is not some uh, set of religious dogmas. It is called jiva dharma, the dharma, that is the natural activity of the soul. Sometimes the word dharma is translated as religion, but that's not really the meaning. Dharma comes from Dridatu in Sanskrit, that means to hold. So Dharma is that quality that something holds and can never let go. Because it's part of the intrinsic identity of that thing. For example, the Dharma of fire is to emit heat and light. Right? There's no such thing as Christian fire, Hindu fire, Buddhist fire, Jewish fire. Fire is fire. If it doesn't emit heat and light, it's not fire. That's, that's its dharma. It's the dharma of the sugar to be sweet. Maybe white sugar, maybe brown sugar, maybe cubes or lumps or powder or anything. But if it's not sweet, it's not sugar. So dharma is that quality that something holds, which is its intrinsic identity. So then the question comes, we're all jiva, souls, spiritual beings, what is our Dharma? What is our 
natural occupation. So, to understand this, the example of water is very helpful. It's the dharma of water to flow and be liquid. However, if the water is kept in an un unnatural place, like in the refrigerator, then what happens? It doesn't flow anymore. It becomes hard. It becomes solid. And so that's not the nature of water at room temperature. That's not its nature. But that is called the nisarga. That is, nisarga in Sanskrit means acquired nature. It has been acquired by certain circumstances. So in the same way, the dharma of every soul is to be in a state of flowing like a liquid, always flowing in love for God. That's our nature. But due to proximity with the material energy, now our nature has become frozen. We are stiff. When we hear about God, if you hear about Krishna, oh, there's a very beautiful young sweet boy in the spiritual world. He plays upon a flute and makes all the animals, even the grass and the trees shiver in ecstasy when he calls them on his flute. Uh, oh, it, it sounds okay. But we don't feel a very strong reaction. Why? Because the heart, uh, our consciousness has become solidified by contact with the external material energy. You see? So the more a person is trying to exploit and enjoy the world around him, the more the heart becomes hardened. And that freezing, the freezing of the consciousness takes place. So all the systems of yoga, all the systems of religion, all the systems of morality are just incremental steps to make us let go of trying to exploit and taste and dominate the physical energy and just slowly become detached from that so we can turn our attention to what lies beyond this world. So that's all morality, all religion, all yoga practices, they're all, by different techniques, one way or another, trying to detach us from the temporary and the external and turn our attention towards the transcendental and the eternal. Like this, you see. So as we become detached from the external things and become attached to uh, service, to engaging our mind and senses in the service of God, acting not for our pleasure, but acting to please our source, Slowly, slowly, our heart comes back to its natural state, room temperature. And in Sanskrit it's called Ruchi Bischita Masrinya Krida Aso Bhav Uchute. The heart melts and now you feel what is called Bhav. Bhav. Ecstatic loving sentiments. So Bhakti Yoga is not some external practice which is imposed upon us. But it's our nature that comes out when we, uh, we're not in the frozen atmosphere of a worldly materialism. It automatically manifests. Understand? So every soul has inherent relationship with God. Have some of you heard of Hanuman? Hanuman, right? So he's not particularly into God in the form of Krishna. Hanuman loves Ram. Lord Ram. And that's great because the Supreme Lord is unlimited. He has unlimited forms and different souls, different devotees have love for God in those different particular forms. So then the question comes, well, why? Why are you so interested in Krishna? Krishna. Vedic literature is explained. It means there are many avatars of the Supreme Lord, the Paramatma, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the highest transcendental personal loving truth, has many forms such as Ram, such as Varaha, Kalki, Buddha, Matsya, Kurma avatar. There are many avatars described. Especially ten are famous. If you ever seen, do you ever see um, a performance of, of 
Bharatanatyam dancing or, or DC dancing. You know, one of the most famous dancing, dances is called Das Avatar Stotram, where the dancer plays the role of the ten main avatars uh, illustrated in dance one after another. So the, there are many avatars and they're famous. But the um, Vedas say, Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam, all of those avatars have an origin. And the original transcendental form from which all the avatars come is Krishna. Now someone may say, hmm, how, is that some kind of sectarian dogmatic idea? And we say no. Because in spiritual life, when you're thinking about your practice, and when you're thinking about that truth that you're approaching, there is some scale by which you can weigh the value of your practice relative to other types of practice. There's some scale by which you can weigh the uh, nature of the truth that you're approaching compared to other conceptions of the truth. And that is called in Sanskrit Purna. Purna. Om Purnam Madaha Punaminam Purnat Punamudachate Purnasya Punamadaya Purnameva Vasisyate That highest reality is perfect and complete. Pur Purana means perfect and complete. complete. So completeness is our measurement of our hierarchies of practices and hierarchies of uh, destinations. So for example, some persons they do a meditation and they empty their mind and they meditate on light, Brahma Jyoti, the spiritual light. So this is an authentic practice. It's an authentic practice. Aham Brahmasmi, I am the light. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, everything comes from that light. Pragyanam Brahma, that light is pure consciousness. Tattvamasi, you are that light. So there are Vakya's statements in the Vedas uh, describing this. And it, it's okay. But the question is this, how complete is that conception? How complete is that process? Because uh, when the consciousness enters into the light, now what will you do? Nothing. Hmm? There's no music there. Can you imagine life without music? No thanks. <laughs> there's no color there. There's no shape. There's no personality there. Hmm? That light is not even going to smile at you. That light's not going to wink at you. <laughs> that light's not going to give you a hug. Right? So even though in one sense we think, well, that's unlimited, but that light is a supreme limitation. Because there's just so many things it cannot do. In Sanskrit, the word Brahma, Brahma, means brinhati, brinhayati, that which is great and which makes others great. And so the truth is called Brahma, the greatest and that which makes others great. And Brahma also means that which does not admit any limitation at all. So because that, that spiritual light, it's a reality, you can experience it. But is there some limitation there? Yeah, many, 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 many limitations. So it's an experience of truth, but it's not Purana, complete. So we have to go further. Let's go further a little. So very literal said, Vadanti tat tattva vidas tattvam yas jnanam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti shabdhate. The meaning is that this spiritual light that the practitioners see when their hearts are purified is just the aura of Ishwar. Ishwar means God, the controller, right? So we have any students of the Yoga Sutras here? Yep. Okay. What's the definition of Ishra from the Yoga Sutras? You remember? Supreme Personality. In the Yoga Sutras, it's not very elaborately defined in a devotional sense, but it's, it's hints which are pointing there. Patanjali said, 
Klesha karma vipakashaya apavrishta purusha vishesh ishvaraha. It means that the Ishvara, or God, is a vishesh purush. Purush means a person who is vishesh, individual, special, particular. And his speciality is klesha karma vipak ashaya. That aparamrishta, that he was never touched at any time by karma and the reactions of karma. You see, sometimes people have an idea, if I meditate and I get mukti liberation, then I become God. But Patanjali says, slow down there. <laughs> Wait a minute. Ishwara is a person who was never ever under the control of karma. So guess what? That's not us. Right? We're not Ishwara. Not happening. If we're Ishwara, then we wouldn't be uh, facing the difficulties. We wouldn't be uh, affected at all by any type of ignorance or limitation. Whereas we, we are, we're very limited. For example, is there anyone in this room who can recite mm, the entire New York telephone directory? <laughs> no, right, okay, good. So we're limited, right? Uh, our knowledge is limited. But Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma, that supreme absolute truth is eternal. Knowledge is unlimited. And he's full of bliss. So Ishwar is that supreme transcendental person, special person who is never affected by um, any limitation or karma or the fruit of karma. And also Patanjali said he is the guru of the ancients, which means that all the sages in ancient times, whatever they know, it was inspired, it was coming from him. So he's a person and he also, those who are searching for him, he cares about them and makes an effort to educate them and bring them out of the ignorance of this world. So, this idea, Ishwara, means who is the creator, the maintainer, and the dissolver of all existence. So the universe goes through cycles of creation, maintenance, and destruction, like breathing, again and again. So, uh, who is the uh, foundation of that, by whose will everything is going on. That is called Ishwar. So that is God. And Patanjali describes how to meditate on that Ishwar in the heart. First, Ishwara uh, Samadhi Siddhi Ishwara Pranidhanat. The perfection of trance comes from surrender to that Ishwara, that Supreme Lord who is living within our heart. And how do you surrender? Uh, by uh, vibrating his name tasya vachaka pranavaha one of the names of god is om so the pranava om is a name of god and you should think that in the yoga sutras of patanjali that that name om is a placeholder it's a it's a placeholder for all the names so you can chant om or you can chant govinda Gopal, Hare Krishna, Radha Raman, Gopi Jannavalam, Gopinath, like this. Any name. Om, Om represents all the names of God here. Um, the difference between Om and Hare Krishna is Om is like a seed. It's called a Bij Mantra. It's a Bij Mantra, seed mantra. So let's say you're hungry. So, but you only have a mango seed, right? Not very tasty, not very juicy. But if you plant it in the ground and it grows, then fruit comes on the tree and that's full of juice, full of, that juice is called a rasa. Something relishable, very tasty. So, Om is the seed of the Vedas. And Maduram, Maduram, Eitan, Mangalam, Mangalanam, Sakama, Nigavali, Satparam, Chitsvarupam, Sakritapi, Parijitam, Shraddhaya, Helayava, Vrgavaranar, Matram, Tarya, Krishna, Nama. It means that Om is the bij, the seed, and Hare Krishna is the juicy fruit growing on the tree of the Vedas. So if you want to really experience uh, the sweetness of transcendental love, then and go for that mantra. That's where the juice is. So, now Ishwara, God, creator, maintainer, destroyer of everything. That is a, that's a truth. 
That's a truth. And you can meditate and discover that. But now the question comes. The question comes. Is it Purna? Is that complete? Was anything missing? Now we really want to, you know when you do yoga and you stretch, so what we want to do today is just stretch your mind. <laughs> stretch. Is that being who is omnipresent everywhere, who is omniscient knowing everything, who is omnipotent controlling all existence, is that personality complete or not? And this is the shocking revelation of the Vedas that you cannot find anywhere. Because in, in all religious conceptions, God goes up to that point, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. No one goes outside of that. But the Vedas say, look, you see, put yourself in God's shoes for a minute. Actually, Krishna doesn't wear shoes. He <laughs> likes to walk barefoot in the forest. But sometimes he, he has some slippers. But he likes to walk barefoot. He's very, Krishna's very natural. But let's just say, hypothetically, you put yourself in God's shoes. If you know everything, and you control everything, mm -hmm. and you are everywhere, then that becomes an obstacle to uh, experiencing the exchange of love with other beings. Huh? It really becomes an obstacle. Let's say, for example, what's your name? Javali. 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 Yes. Wow, that's a great Sanskrit name. Thank you. So let's say that it was Javali's birthday today, just hypothetically. It's Jival, it was Jivali's birthday today, 23, right? So yeah. it's, your, it's your birthday today. And, um, and some of your friends said, hey, let's go to that yoga studio on Fort Lauderdale. There's some class going on. And you say, oh, okay, let's go. Might be interesting. So you go with a few of your friends. But what you don't know is that all your other friends are waiting here for you. They've decorated the whole place with balloons. Mm -hmm. And it, they've got a big cake for you. And not only that, but all your school friends that you haven't seen for years, someone called them, they all came. And all your relatives from other countries, they flew in and you didn't know. And you just walk through that door and when you open the door, everyone's waiting and they go, surprise! And you see your aunts and your cousins and your second cousins and your grandma and, every, and they're all there and they've arranged this beautiful party and they did it just for you. How would you feel? Grateful. Yeah, right. Tears are already coming in your yeah. eyes just thinking about it, right? So yeah, your heart would just melt and you'll just feel such joy, such gratitude and such love for everyone, right? Now, let's just flip the storyline a little bit and say that you're omniscient, right? And you know everything. You just come through the door, everyone's so surprised. You say, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> no. I knew before you knew. Because I'm omniscient. Right? So now, you're God, right? No surprises. No surprises. No one can do something to surprise you, to please you. That means also no adventure, no suspense, no romance, no dangers. And all the things that make up the tapestry of the, um, the emotions that we feel. So what you find is, when a being has this fantastic power and fantastic knowledge and all-pervadingness, that the spectrum of his emotional experiences kind of shrinks down to, mm. I am the top dog and all of you guys, mm. you can't even play mm. a game of chess or anything, because you'll always win. Right? <laughs> you got right? You want to play a game with someone? But there's no fun in that. You always win. You know what moves they're going to make before they make them and everything. Just everything that makes life rich is just completely drained out. So I just want to say that, although some people meditate, they think they want to be God. No, don't try to be God. It's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun. And that position of being Ishra is really, it's not a rich experience. You know? 
And there's a big power difference between you and everyone else. Right? You're in control of everyone, everything, and everyone else is just this tiny little spark of light struggling in the world, and they all bow down and pray to you, oh God, give me this, God, give me that. Like you're a mail order catalog or Amazon or something. Right? Amazon Prime. You have to listen to every take everyone's orders and give them what they want. Right? Is that fun? Right? So that kind of God, that's that's not complete. There's a very it's a very great restriction on the emotional spectrum. Hmm? The thing is that if you're very powerful and everyone is much less than you, there's no equality. And in the absence of that component, that emotional component of equality, you don't really have friends. You don't really have friends. Friendship is with someone you feel some equality with. Right? But let's say you're really, really rich and everyone's really poor. How can you be sure that anyone's your friend? They just want stuff from you. You see? So friendship manifests when there's equality between people. So God is... He's stuck in this position, Ishwar is stuck in this position where he can't be really close with anyone. There's no real friendship and there's no experience of excitement. So that form of Ishwar is called the Paramatma Vishnu. And he's just, mainly he goes in Yoga Nidra like sleeping because there's not much to do. <laughs> his, powers, his powers do everything. You know Vishnu? You always see Vishnu, he's lying down in the middle of the ocean in Yoga Nidra. He's like, being God is just so. Anyway, so luckily, God is, I mean, it's better than being the light, right? At least maybe he's feeling grateful. At least I'm not that empty light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he has some personality and he creates it, right? But the thing is that there's a higher conception which is more purna, more complete. What is that? That is called Bhagavan. So the Vedas say the truth is realized in three stages. First the stage of light, then the stage of Ishwara. The Jnanis realize the light, the Yogis realize the Ishwara, and the Bhaktas Realize Bhagavan, the, the complete, the fullest manifestation of truth. Now, what does Bhagavan do? He does a Leela. The word Leela in Sanskrit means play. It means play. People who are struggling in this world, they have to work. But people who have everything, what do they do? They play. So Bhagavan is like that. Vishnu has to go to work. He has to create the universe and destroy it from time to time. But the, the fullest aspect of reality just does Leela, play. Now, in order to play, he has one Shakti, one energy. It's called Yoga Maya, the energy of yoga. Yoga means union, meeting. So. This yoga maya makes the possibility of different types of loving relationship. So what yoga maya does is, though Bhagavan is also omniscient, but yoga maya covers the knowledge of Krishna, and then Krishna feels, I'm a boy. I'm a little boy. I like to play in the forest with my cows. And then, his God's energies, his mystic potencies, his powers of love that emanate from him, they, their knowledge also becomes covered by Yoga Maya. And they feel that they're also gopis, cowherd goats. They live in a village and they just love this boy who lives there. Nanda Nanda and Yashoda Nanda. Like this. And so Krishna goes into the forest at night and plays his flute. And all those beautiful gopis, they sneak out of their homes and they meet with him and dance with him in the moonlight. So there's a romance, there's adventure, there's secret, there's suspense. So it's not real. They're not breaking any dharma or doing anything wrong. But the Leela, the Leela Shakti, the power of pastimes, Yoga Maya, creates a drama so that the Supreme Lord Krishna can taste different types of love exchanged with his devotees. So some of his devotees, they're friends. They become boys like him. They wrestle with him. They have man time together, you know. 
they go swimming, they climb trees, they have picnic in the forest. So they have their fr some are friends with him in the spiritual world, and some are like parents, and they have forms of older personalities who take him like their child and take him in the lap, you know, because that's another flavor of love. And then the gopis, the coward girls, they love him as their as their sweetheart. So this is the important thing. If a person, sometimes people propose that the light is that's the last truth. There's nothing beyond that. So if the light is that from which everything emanated, then that you can explain the forms of this world. If the ultimate ground of truth is light, then why do we have, you know, blue sea and green forests and beautiful colored flowers? Why do we have two arms and two legs and eyes? Why do we have relationships like friendship and uh, love for a child, a child's love for the parents, or romantic love. What's the blueprint? Where, where does this all come from? So the answer is that the material world is a shadow or reflection of the spiritual world. So all these relationships that you find here in Maya, in the world of illusion, have, are their shadows of the real relationships in the realm of Yoga Maya, the spiritual energy. You see? So there's an exact, the philosophy of bhakti has such a beauty, such a symmetry that makes everything make sense. It makes everything make sense. So the, the, the purnata, the completeness, full completeness is there in Krishna. In Ishwara, Narayan, that is Vishnu, he's powerful, he has something. But he cannot experience that broad spectrum of spiritual emotions in the way that Krishna does. And so the conclusion is, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. On those levels of realization, the last level is that beautiful Krishna and his goddess of love, his loving potency Radha, Radha Krishna. And the prayer to Radha Krishna is Hare Krishna. Hare means Radha. So Hare Krishna means Radha and Krishna. It's a prayer to them. So not only is the goal that we're aiming for Purna, it is we can wait in comparison to all other goals and see that it's the complete picture. But also the process by which we approach the complete is a complete process as well. Hmm? Why is that? Because the form of God is called Satchid Ananda. Satchid Ananda, you may have heard this phrase, it's very common. Satchid Ananda. Sat means existence. Chit means consciousness. And Ananda means bliss. So, if, you, if you're doing a, a practice, a spiritual sadhana, then if you take shelter of jnana, knowledge, that's the chit potency, you can realize Brahman. So if you do jnana yoga, you realize the light of Brahman. It's a consciousness, chit consciousness. If you have a process which employs the two energies, chit and sat, sat means existence. So there's no form in the light of Brahman. But Ishwara has a form. The Paramatma in the heart, Vishnu, he has a form. So when you do yoga sadhana, you take shelter of the energies of Sat and Chit, so you can realize Ishwara. But when you practice Bhakti, Bhakti yoga, you are taking shelter of the energies of Sat, existence, Chit, knowledge, consciousness, and Ananda, joy joy as well. And so uh, the goal of our practice, Krishna is the complete goal and Bhakti Yoga is the complete process because it involves the uh, infusion into our heart not only of Chit, knowledge, not only of Sat, eternity, but also in Ananda, joy. And that was our introduction today to the subject of Bhakti Yoga. Everything is clear? Everything becomes clear through the hearing process. If you listen to someone who has vision beyond this world, then what happens here? 
here, here, become clear. <laughs> all the mist, all the fog, all the vagueness, it's dissipated and we become focused on, the, on our path. So, um, that was our discussion on Bhakti Yoga for today. And if you'll allow me, I'll speak a little bit more about the significance of this day in the calendar, the Bhakti Yoga calendar. Is that okay? Oh, Hari Yoga. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. Are we unanimous on that? Yeah. Okay. Today is a special day in the Bhakti calendar. It's called uh, the Appearance Day of Gadadhar Pandit. Has anyone heard of Gadadhar Pandit? Yes, people? <laughs> okay. Perhaps, uh, who's been to Jagannath Puri? Yeah? <laughs> Some people have been to Puri, right? Okay. So there's a famous deity of Krishna there called Gopinath. And that, that's the only deity of Krishna who, who's sitting down like this in cross leg. Mm. He's playing flute, but he's sitting down. You see, remember? That deity in Puri? Uh, it's very big. Like this, like With Radha on one side and Lalisa on the other. So that, that's the deity of Godara Pandit in Puri. So today is the day that he, he, he was born, um, just over about 530 years ago. So one of the practices that's very important in the Bhakti tradition, that on the birthdays and also the disappearance days, we don't say death, it's the disappearance, when the saints you know, leave this plane, when they ascend. So celebrating those appearance days and disappearance days is a very important aspect of Bhakti Yoga. And the reason is this, that on those days the saints and various incarnations, they bestow a special grace upon those who remember them on that day. So you're all very fortunate today because I want to speak a few words about the life of Gadara Pandit and simply by listening in a peaceful state of mind and trying to imbibe the teachings which are there, definitely uh, a very powerful spiritual grace will descend upon you. I guarantee. Money back guarantee. Okay. Krishna is so kind that after he did his pastimes in this world 5,000 years ago, he went back to his spiritual Galok Vrindavan and he was thinking, I gave some teaching about Bhakti, but I didn't show people how to do it by my own example. So Krishna appeared again and played the role of a devotee to teach us how to practice Bhakti by his own example. So he appeared in Navadi, Mayapur, in the year 1486 and became famous as Sri Chaitanya, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Krishna Chaitanya. Chaitanya means consciousness. So, and so Krishna appeared again and just played the role of a devotee to teach us how to follow Bhakti. And at that time, Radha also appeared in the form of a devotee to assist Krishna in that pastime. So that form of Radha is called Gadada Pandit. So Gadada is the incarnation of Radha in this Kali Yuga who appeared with Chaitanya and together they're teaching us about the path of devotion. Okay? And this is the day. It's a special day. Right? It's a special, special day. Uh, so Gadada appeared um, one year after Chaitanya, so in about 1487, in the village, village of Baletigran, in the district of Chittagom, uh, which is now, it was, it was Bengal in those days, now it's become part of Bangladesh. And when he was about 12 years old, his parents moved to Navadweep. So from the age of 12, he associated with Chaitanya, they used to go to school together. So and this is where we come to the first teaching in the life of Gadara Pandit. You see, when Chaitanya was at school, he was really into Nyai. Nyai means logic. Navya Nyai, Navya Nyai, logic. 
logic is, I don't know if you ever met this type of person who's really analytical into all things, splitting hairs, you know, and <laughs> then split, the split hair into another split, and just keep going like this. And it seems really interesting in the beginning, it may be, but when you go through it at the end, you're just more confused than you were when you started with it. Just dry logic by itself, without the, without the support of revelation, realization, without the support of Vedas, it just, it's fruitless. The example is given, it said it's like um, beating rice husk. If you take rice paddy and you beat it, then the rice comes out of the husk. You can take the rice and you can cook it. But after you've done that, if you keep beating the husk, then what do you get? You just sweat, you know, you don't, you don't get anything, it's just a sweat. So, logic is like that. You try to analyze everything all the time, but you don't have any guidance of a realized person, of a guru or Vedas, it, you'll just sweat and in the end you'll be left with nothing. So when Chaitanya was a, was a young student, he, he played this uh, leela of being totally into logic. And especially in, in those days, there was a new type of logic called Navian Nair. And, they, and the students they would meet, they would argue all the time. For example, uh, here we go. Let's, I'll give you a quick lesson in the ancient wisdom of Navian Nyaya. Uh, I'll bet someone, anyone in this room, $100, that there are no flowers in this vase. And I'll prove it, logically. Who wants to come on? Who want, who's ready to play? <laughs> this is Miami, right? It's a casino. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to play? Of course, no one wants to play because most of you know me. <laughs> so, in Navian Nai, they, they would do things, they would argue and prove, they would make black and white, black is white, night is day. Okay, so there are no flowers in this bus. I'll prove it now. What is this vase made of? Glass. When the person made this vase, he took the molten sand and he, he was blowing the glass, right? Now, when he was making this vase, did he put some flowers in the molten glass? No. no. So there are no flowers in this vase. I've proved it. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> there are no flowers in this place. <laughs> the guy, he got the sand, he melted it, he blew the glass, he didn't add any flowers. There are no flowers in the vase. Okay. Because there, in logic you discuss different types of sambandha. So you can have by samavai sambandha, that means by inheritance. There's no flowers in the vase, inherent in the vase itself. But there are flowers in the vase by what is called samyog sambandha, that means relationship of union or touch. You see? Because look, there are no flowers in the vase. And you put them in. Now there are flowers in the vase by samyog sambandha, by touch, hmm? by connection. But there's still no flowers in the vase by samavai sambandha, inherent. So, like this. When Chaitanya was a young boy, he used to spend his time doing this, arguing with everyone about pointless things. But Gadadha, what did he do from his childhood? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, 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 He was meditating, he was worshipping God, he was offering flowers to his deity, offering food to his deity, reading the pastimes and hearing the pastimes of Krishna. So his mind and senses were always absorbed in Krishna. And as you do that gradually and you become really, really saturated in the memory of Krishna, then all your hair stand on end and you can feel the divine ecstasy. So bhakti is real knowledge. The Srimad Bhagavatam says, Tadvidya tan materiyaya. Ya vidya tan materiyaya. It means true knowledge is how to be tanmoy, absorbed. Not distracted, not lost in little details of life, but absorbed in the memory of Krishna. 
all the time. That's real knowledge. So you can do that by chanting, by singing, by dancing, by serving the deity, by going on pilgrimage to holy places and having discussions with saints. Mm -hmm. Then you can become tanmai, absorbed. And, and then the truth is manifested, revealed. When you hear, 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 you become clear, 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 and we have realization of Krishna. And so, when in their childhood, Gadarha and Chaitanya, they were very different characters. One was always doing the, the, the logic, and, but Gadarha was always doing bhakti. And so when Gadara used to see Chaitanya coming, he used to cross the street. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. when, he, when he was young, his name was Nimai. Chaitanya's name was Nimai. It's all oh, Nimai Pandit's coming now. I'm going to cross the street. Because if he finds me, he'll engage me in some wrangling argument about something. And it's just, there's no love in that. So he used to avoid him. But he used to pray. He used to pray, Oh Krishna. He didn't know that he was Krishna because they're all in Yoga Maya, you know, everyone. So he used to pray, Oh Krishna. Please be merciful, give grace to my friend who is wasting his life in all of this wrangling and analysis, analytical thoughts. Yeah. So then one day it happened that Chaitanya, he traveled from Navadweep and he went to Gaya and he met his guru there. And uh, his guru gave him the Hare Krishna mantra and he began to chant. And as he was chanting, he saw the beautiful form of Krishna smiling, playing mm. his flute. And, he, and there was a fragrance coming from Krishna that was so beautiful, he felt as if he wanted to embrace him. But when he ran to embrace Krishna, that vision disappeared. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu fell to the ground in the shock of separation. When you lose someone who's really dear to you, it's very shocking to the heart. So he fainted. And when he came around, he was just crying always, Krishna, Krishna. And he came back from the pilgrimage in Gaya and he came back to Navadweep. And when he saw Gadadha, he said, Oh, you are so fortunate. Because your whole life you were following Bhakti. I've just discovered Bhakti. But your whole life you were, uh, you were practicing Bhakti. But I, have, I had wasted mine. So that's really beautiful. Because the same persons, Krishna and Radha, in Radha Krishna Lila, there's a similar situation there that Radha has more love than Krishna. And Krishna comes to Radhika and says, Na pariyam niravadya samyujyam swasadu kityam vibhuda. Oh Radha, I can never repay you. Essentially, Vrindavan Leela is a school where God is learning, Krishna is learning the meaning of love from the goddess of love, Radha. And now they've appeared, and they're both practicing Bhakti to teach us. But mm -hmm. Krishna, in the form of Chaitanya, has this um, pastime of a conversion experience. A conversion experience. He takes his books of Nyai, logic, and he binds them up and throws them in the Ganges. He throws them away and just starts singing and dancing with everyone. And so that's a teaching. Uh, he's, he's, he's attracting all those who, who are interested in uh, logic and reason. And, and he's just showing them, no, no, that's not the path. You, your heart will not be satisfied by that. Go into bhakti. Mm -hmm. And all knowledge will come automatically by bhakti. You don't think that uh, someone on the path of bhakti is not logical or reasonable. They have the highest logic and the highest transcendental reason. But you won't come there by your own effort. It comes by grace, by devotion only. Mm -hmm. So, now as you probably know, uh, Chaitanya, he, when he was only 24 years old, he became a sannyasi. He left his wife and mother and he became a monk in the renounced order. And from Navadweep he moved to Jagannath Puri. And all his close associates, friends, they used to visit him in Jagannath Puri. And they used to, and after staying there for some time, he used to send them away, go back to Bengal, wherever they can, go to Vrindavan. He would send them away. So Gadadha was so attached to Chaitanya that he. He, he did a kind of a trick. He came to Puri and said, I am accepting Chetra Sanyas. So Chetra Sanyas doesn't exactly mean that you become a monk. What it means is that you make a vow to live in a holy place and never step one foot outside of that holy place. It's because there's, the holy places have power. So when you're devoted to the holy place, the, that's called the Dham. The Dham also gives mercy. 
as well, Vrindavan, the dust of Vrindavan, the dust of Jagannath Puri. It has a Shakti, that inconceivable power that can completely change your life. Anyone who's gone to this place, they can have experienced it. So, so one form of bhakti is devotion to the holy place. So he took a vow. I vow, Chetra Sanyas, I will never leave Jagannath Puri. So when Chaitanya was sending everyone, go back, go to Vrindavan, go to Navadri, like that, he couldn't say that to Gadardhar because once you make a vow, you're not allowed to break it. This is Vedic cult, not like today, people say something and then change their mind. In Vedic culture, if you say something, that's it. you have to live up to your word. Otherwise, it will cause a, um, a distortion of your personality. Every time you lie, every time you tell a lie, your personality slowly is, becomes distorted. So this is a truthfulness is very, very important. So then Chaitanya, he could send them all away, but Gadara was there and would stay with him in Puri. And uh, there are so many beautiful pastimes. I'll just select one or two. Once there was a great devotee, his name was Mukunda. And he was friends with Gadada and he said, hey, I know this sadhu, I know Vaishnav, he's so advanced, he's so realized, please come with me and let's go and visit him. So Gadada said, okay, let's go. So they set off and they came to one very palatial house. And this person was named Pundurik Vidyaniti. He was lying down, he was reclining on a chaise lounge covered with very fine silk cloth, as soft as the, as the foam of milk, with beautiful silk bolsters and pillars all around him. One servant was fanning him. One servant was giving him pan, you know, tambo. They yeah. chew tambo for the breath, and it's a little bit intoxicating as well. <laughs> One person was giving tambo, and when you chew it, your mouth becomes full of saliva, it's red. So you have to chew and then spit and chew and spit again. So he had a gold spittoon as well. So he was relaxing there. Servants were fanning him. He was chewing the tambu. His hair was uh, covered with very fragrant, expensive oil. And he was and he was spitting sometimes in the gold spittoon. And Kodana Pandit walked in and looked at him. He said, that's a, that's a devotee, that's a bhakta, a Vaishnava, a realized person. He's just a sense enjoyer. He's, just a, he's, he's drowning in comfort and luxury. That's, that's not a devotee. He didn't say it, but he was just thinking it. And he was disappointed. So then Mukunda, he saw that Gadara was disappointed. So he hatched a plan how to change his mind. He just began to sing a verse from the greatest of all the Vedic scriptures. What's that? What's the greatest of all the Vedic scriptures? Mm -hmm. uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Vyasadeva's own explanation of Vedanta Sutra. Mm -hmm. Vyas wrote Vedanta Sutra, it's the cream of the cream. But then he explained it in Srimad Bhagavatam. This is the best mm, scripture. You just try to read it every day. It's amazing, amazing. So one verse from that, Mukunda began to sing. Oh ho bakiyam stanakala kutam jigyam sayapaya yad at posadvi la begat in that rutitan tatam yam kamba dialum shanam brajima. And when he sang that verse, then Pundarik Vidinidi began to tremble. Tears began to flow from his eyes. And he tore his shirt, he kicked over his golden spittoon. He rolled off the bed onto the floor and fainted in ecstasy. <laughs> and when Gadara Pandit saw that, he thought, Wow, he's really a bhakta. Mm -hmm. This verse is uh, spoken after Krishna had disappeared from this world. One of his near devotees, Uddhav, he was thinking, oh, Krishna is so kind that when Krishna was a little baby, one witch came to kill him and she smeared poison on her breast and she came disguised as a very loving sweet mother and, and, and said to his mother, can I feed your baby? 
And Yashoda said, yes. yes. And she, she, he picked up baby Krishna to kill him, to assassinate him. But by the touch of the lips of Krishna, he sucked and the poison did not affect him. But he sucked out her pran, her life. And once she aged from, you know, like 21 to 100 in a moment. And she became huge and she died. But that's what, Krishna didn't kill her. He, he uh, actually destroyed her karma. Because her body, your body is made of your karma. It's prarabdha karma. Everyone's body is different because you've all acted differently in the past. And the body that you have now is your karma file, the fruit of your past activities. You see? So it, don't think that Krishna killed her, but rather he took away all her bad karma and he gave love to her soul and sent her to the spiritual world. So after Krishna had left, one devotee was crying, saying, Krishna is so kind. Even someone tries to kill him. He doesn't see good or bad or anything. He just welcomes everyone and he purifies everyone and he sends them to the spiritual world. How wonderful is that? Because we're all used to having this idea of God as being like this big judge in the sky. And he's casting, okay, let me just check. You've done in your life 5,439 bad things and 5,438 good things. <laughs> Sorry, you've got to go to hell. <laughs> and you know, he's casting people into hell because they did more bad than good or something. <laughs> this very judgmental idea of Krishna is not like that. Krishna is, not, Krishna is called Karuna Sindhu, ocean of mercy. You know, when, when the tide is out, if a, if a king will come and sit on the shore of the ocean and wait, then the waves will come in and wash over him. But if a penniless beggar will sit on the shore, the waves will come and wash over him. If a dog will sit on the shore, the waves will come and wash So Krishna is like that. He's like an ocean of mercy. If someone will just approach him and wait, then his mercy will come. He's not judgmental like that. So that's what we do. When we chant Hare Krishna, when we chant the Mama, we're just approaching Krishna and we're waiting for the waves of the ocean of Krishna's mercy to wash over us. So just be patient. Yeah. I'm like a dog. I'm a useless, stupid person. But I'm just sitting on the shore of the ocean and chanting every day. And after some time, then you can experience the waves of divine grace. So that, that devotee who was not recognizable in any way as being a spiritual being. When he heard that description of Krishna's kindness, unconditional kindness, he was just in ecstasy. And he began to manifest all the symptoms of love and he fainted. So then Gadara Pandit, he thought, I've committed, he, this is a great saint, but in my mind I criticized him. So that's really important. Don't criticize any saint or any devotee. Or better still, anyone in your mind. Because when you criticize someone, you construct a bridge between your heart and their heart, and all their bad qualities become go, go marching over that bridge and come to you. <laughs> it's like peeing on an electric wire. Don't do it. <laughs> because when you connect with someone through criticism, this is like electricity. It comes to you and you find the next day or the next week or the next year, exactly what you were saying was wrong in that person, you're doing it yourself. But if you only see the good in others, that also makes a bridge. And if that quality is not in you, but it will come to you. And so in regard to materialistic persons, ordinary persons, don't criticize them, but don't praise them also. Save all your praise for a saint and for your guru. And then what will happen? That will make a bridge of connection with the saint's heart and Krishna will cross that bridge and come in your heart. And this is the secret of spiritual life, actually. So, so Gadara Pani, he was thinking, in my mind, I criticize this great saint, I've done a terrible thing. And the only way I can become free from this is if I accept him as guru. So he went to Chaitanya and he asked permission, can I take Diksha, initiation, mantra initiation from him. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu agreed. So he went and then that Pundri Vitanidhi gave Diksha, gave mantras and instructions how to meditate to Gadara Pandit and became his Diksha Guru. 
Now, there's some all the pastimes of Krishna, all the pastimes of Chaitanya have some mysteries inside them. So if Gadara Pandit is the incarnation of Radha, then in this world who can be the guru of Radha? Who has love greater than Radha? Who can take that senior position in relation to her? So who is that person, Pundri Vidyanidhi, who is incarnated in this world from the spiritual plane? Who is he? He is Brishobhanu Maharaj. That is Radharani's father in the spiritual world. <laughs> so Radharani's name is Brishobhanu Nandini, the daughter of King Brishobhanu, you see? So when Krishna came as Chaitanya, Radha came as Gadadha, and Brishobhanu came as Pundarik. And that's why Gadadha takes Diksha and shelter there, just as a father is always giving loving shelter and care to her, uh, her, uh, his uh, children, or daughter, sons. So this is a very important pastime that Gadadha is teaching us, and that is what? Don't try to judge a saint with your material eyes. Don't look, oh, this saint is too tall or too small or too black or too white or too fat or too thin. Don't try to materially measure a saint. Try to just give respect and listen. And by listening, see the effect it has on your consciousness. A saint should never be seen through the eyes. A saint is always seen through the ears. That's how we can identify a saintly person, a transcendental person. By listening to their vibration, something starts to move inside. And then we know, ah, oh, he is a spiritual person. Because our eyes can always deceive us. Our eyes are always deceiving us. Don't put faith in your eyes. In spiritual life, you have to put faith in the ear. So, I'm going to tell, just to complete today, one more pastime of Gadadha, which is really, really helpful and practical in our life. Once upon a time, there was a, a great scholar and devotee. His name was Vallabhacharya. The, uh, perhaps some of you have heard of Shamdas. Uh, did any, he passed away a few years ago. Who's heard of Shamdas? Yeah, yeah. So he was my very close friend. He also lived in Vrindavan for many years. So he would often come and knock on my door, hey, pray, come on, let's go. <laughs> and we'd go to visit different saints and, and kirtans in, in Vrindavan. So he was from that Sampradaya of this Vallabh, Vallabhacharya. So Vallabhacharya, he came to Puri once. And he, he came to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Vallabhacharya was very much into puja, you know, worshipping the deities and offering prayers, singing songs, but not so much into japa the repetition of the Maha Mantra. So he came to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates, he said, you know, God is uh, Purush, male, and all his energies are ontologically or metaphysically Prakriti or female in relation to him. So in Vedic culture, a wife, the female, never says the name of the husband. Wife never takes her husband's name. She'll say, oh son, you are the son of this one, or Arya Putra, son of a nobleman, very, or Swami. They're very respectful and endearing ways that the wife uh, addresses the husband. But the husband is considered so dear that she, she doesn't speak it out loud or in front of anyone. So, he said, if we're all Prakriti, female, in relation to the Purush, then why are you always saying the name of Krishna? Krishna, Krishna, Krishna all the time. Is that valid? So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said to him, Yes, it's right. The wife doesn't say the name of the husband. But if the husband will say, hmm, You should utter my name, then the wife will say it. Because his order takes precedence over the cultural uh, etiquette. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Just see, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Satatam kirtayanto mam ye jana paryapashate. Hmm? That my devotees, they're always chanting my name. Devotees should always, Satatam kirtayanto mam, always chant my name. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So Krishna said, we should, so we're following what Krishna has said. So then that pandit, that scholar Valabhacha, he became quiet. Then on another day he was thinking, how can I show my knowledge? 
this is really important that we should not be eager to assert our own value in the presence of others this is a sign of insecurity it's a sign of egotism just be practical in your life others will see practically what you're doing so oh and they may ask some question like this but otherwise be be peaceful but he was trying to assert his own worth in that community of devotees who are very very learned very advanced so he was thinking how can i show my knowledge amongst them so one day he came he said Hmm? I have written a commentary on the Maha Mantra. Would you like to hear it? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I am not a very advanced person. <laughs> I am not qualified to hear such elevated discussion. I only know that the, the name of Krishna means Sham Sundar. Beautiful boy with a complexion like a rain cloud. Sham Sundar. And Krishna means Yashoda Nanda. The son of Yashoda, the coward boy. And I am not qualified to hear any higher explanations. Please excuse me. So you see the comparison here. One person was trying to establish how great he was. And Chaitanya was, I am not so learned. I am not qualified to learn about these things. And he was showing humility. So again he failed. So then on another day, he came into the assembly and he said, I have written a commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam. Now the Bhagavatam is the best of all the Vedic literatures. And there's a commentator from a thousand years ago named Sridhar Swami. And all the devotees, they follow his example. And when they write something, they just expand on what he said, but they never refute him. So Vallabhacharya, he said, I have written a commentary that even disproves and goes beyond the commentary of Sri Swami. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard this, he said, one who does not follow the Swami, Swami means husband, one who is not chased to the Swami is a prostitute. So it was a play on words. On the one hand it meant, if one tries to go beyond the explanation of Sri Swami, then you actually because mercy is coming down from guru to guru. If you try to <coughs> criticize one of the earlier gurus, you're disconnecting yourself. That's your pipeline to the grace of Krishna. So if you criticize your previous gurus, you just cut your own lifeline. <coughs> so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he said, no, no, no. I don't want to hear. And then he would, again, he was sad. Now three times in a row, he tried to assert his worth and impress others. And he failed. So then he thought, I really want to read my commentary. So he went up to Gadara Pandit privately. And he said, oh Gadara, so come and sit down with me. Let's read my commentary together. Now Gadara was very, very humble. So he didn't quarrel. He didn't say anything. And he just sat there. He didn't protest. And in his heart he was thinking, uh-oh. Now some controversy will come. Because Chaitanya said he didn't want to hear, and all of his followers, they're also not here. And if they hear that I was hearing, then everyone will be upset with me. Hmm? And they'll think that I went against Chaitanya, and there'll be a big scandal. But on the other hand, Vallabha is a very senior person. He's a, I should respect him, so I don't want to quarrel with him. So he was just sitting there, and he was thinking, everyone will criticize me. It will be very scandalous, but I don't want to hurt his feelings. And at the same time, I know that Chaitanya knows my heart and he'll deal with me accordingly. So then afterwards, the rumor spread that he was listening to this explanation of Balabacharya. And uh, Chaitanya said, oh, tell Gurdadha not to come here anymore. He should not come here anymore. So he, Gurdadha was now ostracized from that community for for this offense, if you like. So Gadada was staying in his place. That, that place is called it Yameshwar Tot. The, it's a garden of the deity of Lord Shiva, called Yameshwar Mahadev. And next to Yameshwar Mahadev, there's a beautiful orchard of olive trees. And he, Gadada was staying there, and he was just staying there. And he was very heartbroken. I can't go to Chaitanya anymore. And three days passed. 
After three days, Chaitanya told some his associates, Oh, Jagadananda, Swarup Damodar, go and tell Gadara to come here. So they set off and they came to him. They said, Gadara, Chaitanya is calling you. So he got up and they were walking together. So those two, they said to Gadara, We know you didn't do anything wrong, but still, Chaitanya ostracized you for no reason. Aren't you upset with him? Aren't you angry with him? Don't you feel you've been unfairly treated? How can you be so submissive like this? Look at that, he was just quiet. And he came to Chaitanya and he bowed down. And Chaitanya said, You have done nothing wrong, but I have treated you unjustly just to provoke you. To see your reaction, but you have no reaction because you are completely free from ahankar, completely free from ego. You are completely humble, dedicated. Your love is unconditional. Your love is similar to the love of that Rukmini had for Krishna. Chaitanya said. So because of this, you have purchased my heart. So understand the teaching in life that if you're a devotee if you're a bhakta and you're always serving Krishna but problems come difficulties obstacles they come in your life don't think that it's an obstacle you should think Krishna is trying to provoke me <laughs> to see my reaction if I'll remain calm equipoised in a state of equanimity and also not go against but to continue to serve to continue to express devotion in bhakti huh? so it's a test to see is our love unconditional or not you know just like when you're cooking rice so is the rice done yet so you take out one grain and you, you, you squeeze it right? and if it's still a bit hard then you leave it in there so basically our life is like that you practice your bhakti sadhana, chanting, praying, hearing, serving your guru every day. And every now and then, Krishna is going to poke you to see if you're cooked. <laughs> huh? the problem, that's the problems in your life. That's just Krishna poking you to see if you're cooked. And if you get all dramatic, oh, what about this and what about that? And, you talk, and blaming this one and that one, like that, then Krishna just puts you back in the, in the pot. Like that. And, and he's waiting. Huh? And then he'll... And one day he's going to provoke you and you'll just be, Hari Ro. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be smiling. And when you're in that state of mind, then Krishna, oh, now you're good. I'm coming! And Krishna will come and play in your heart. So this is the teaching. I hope that today the grace of Godada Pandit will rain on all of us. Go, Rupa!